Hi, MacArthur friends, and welcome to our Young Adult Read Along. Today we are starting with Chapter 26 of Cinder by Marissa Meyer, read with permission by the publisher. Chapter 26 Prince Kai arrived at the meeting 17 minutes late. He was met with disgruntled looks of Torin and four other government officials, all sitting at a long table, along with an additional dozen faces peering out from their respective net screens on the paneled wall before him. Ambassadors from every earthen country, the United Kingdom, the European Federation, the African Union, the American Republic, and Australia. One queen, two prime ministers, one president, one governor general, three state representatives, and two province rep representatives. Text along the bottom of screens helpfully displayed their names, titles, and country affiliations. How kind of the young prince to grace us with his presence, said Torin, as the off officials around the table stood to welcome Kai. Kai waved Torin's comment away. I thought you could use my guidance. On the wall screens, Prime Minister Kamen of Africa grunted most unla unladylike. Everyone else remained silent. Kai moved to take his regular seat when Torin stopped him and gestured at the chair at the end of the table. The Emperor's chair. Jaw clenching, Kai switched seats. He looked up at the grid of faces, although each of the world le leaders was thousands of miles away, staring into their own wall of net screens. It felt as if their eyes were focused on him, disapproving. He cleared his throat, trying not to fidget. Is this conference link secure? He asked, the question bringing back his concerns over the direct communication chip Cinder had found inside Nassini. The screens in this room were equipped with DCOMs so they could hold international meetings without fear of anyone listening through the net. Had the chip inside Nassini been put there by one of Levana's cronies for the same reason? Secrecy? Privacy? If so, what exactly had she learned? Of course, said Torin. The links have been verified for nearly 20 minutes, your highness. We were just discussing Earth's relationship with Luna when you dined to join us. Kai clasped his hands together. Right. Now, is the is that the one where the dominatrix queen throws a tantrum and threatens us, threatens war every time she doesn't get her way? That relationship? No one laughed. Torin's gaze focused on Kai. Is this timing inconvenient for you, your highness? Kai cleared his throat. I apologize. That was inappropriate. He met the faces of the Earth's leaders, watching him from thousands of miles away. He gripped his hands beneath the table, feeling like a child sitting in on his father's meetings. Obviously, said President Vargas from America, the relationship between Earth and Luna has been strained for many years, and the rule of Queen Levana has only made things worse. We can't put blame on any one party, but the important thing is we fix it before, before she starts a war, finished a province representative from South America, as the young prince has already observed. But if the reports on the net are not mistaken, said Governor General Williams of Australia, communication between Earth and Luna has begun again. Can it be true that Levana is on Earth now? I could hardly believe the news when I heard it. Yes, said Torin, as all eyes switched to him. The Queen arrived yesterday afternoon, and her head thermometer, Sybil Mira, has been a guest in our court for just over two weeks. Has Levana informed you of her purpose for this visit? said Prime Minister, Prime Minister Cameron. She claims that she wants to reach a peace agreement. One of the American Republic reps guffawed. I'll believe it when I see it. President Vargas ignored the comment. Quite suspicious timing, isn't it? So soon after, he didn't finish. No one looked at Kai. We agree, said Torin, but we could not refuse the request when it came. It does seem she was more apt to discuss an alliance with the Commonwealth than any of us, said President Vargas. But her requests were always unsatisfactory. Have those requests changed? Kai watched from the corner of his eye as Torin's chest slowly expanded. No, he said. To our knowledge, Her Majesty's requests have not changed. Her aim continues to be a marriage alliance with the Commonwealth's Emperor. Although the faces in the room and on the screens tried to remain static, the discomfort ratcheted around them. Kai gripped his hands so tight that the crescent moons were left from his fingernails. He had always despised the, dipl the, the diplomacy of these meetings, everyone thinking the same thing, no one brave enough to say it. And of course, they would all be sympathetic to Kai's fate, and yet glad it wasn't any of them. They would be angry that Queen Levana could infiltrate any earthen country with her dictatorship, and yet certain that it would be an improvement over infiltrating Earth with her army. The Commonwealth's position, continued Torin, has also not changed. This did seem to jolt the crowd. You won't marry her, said Queen Camilla of the United Kingdom, the wrinkles on her forehead deepening. Kai squared his shoulders in defense. My father was firm in his decision to avoid such an alliance, 
and I believe his reasons are as applicable today as they were last week or last year or 10 years ago. I must consider what is best for my country. Have you told this to Levana? I have not lied to her. And what will be her next move, said Prime Minister Bormstad of Europe, a fair-haired man with kind eyes. What else, said Kai? She intends to add more bargaining chips to the pile until we cave. Stairs clashed through the screens. Torin's lips had gone white, his eyes urging Kai to tread lightly. Kai could guess that Torin hadn't intended to mention the antidote, at least until they could plan their next move. But leptomosis was a pandemic that affected them all. They at least had a right to know that an antidote might exist, assuming Levana hadn't lied to them. Kai took a deep breath, splaying his palms out on the table. Levana claims to have found a cure for leptomosis. The net scream seemed to crackle with surprise, though the gathered leaders were all too stunned to speak. She brought a single dosage with her, and I've passed it off to our research team. We won't know if it's a true antidote until they've had a chance to study. If it is real, we need to find out if we can replicate it. And if we can't replicate it? Kai looked at the Australian Governor General. He was older than Kai's father had been by many years. They were all so much older than him. I don't know, he said, but I will do what has to be done for the Commonwealth. He enunciated Commonwealth very carefully. True, they were an alliance, six countries, and a single planet strong, but they all had their own loyalties, and he would not forget his. Even then, said Torin, we can yet hope to make her see reason and convince her to sign the, the Treaty of Bremen without a marriage alliance. She will refuse, said a state representative from the EF. She, we mustn't fool ourselves. She is as stubborn. Of course, the Commonwealth's imperial family is not the only royal bloodline she could harbor, harbor hopes of marrying into, said the African state representative. He said this knowing that his own country could not be a choice, as it was not a monarchy. Any marriage bond would be too superficial, too transient, he continued. I think we should explore all, all possible options so that we can be sure not to have an offer prepared, no matter what Levana decides to do next. An offer that we, as a group, feel would best benefit the citizenry of our entire planet. Kai had followed the group's attention to Queen Camilla of the UK, who had an unmarried son in his early 30s, closer to Levana's age than Kai was. He noted how passive the queen was trying to appear and had to keep himself from looking smug. It felt nice to turn the tables. And yet, politically, there was no doubt that Kai was the best option in Queen Levana's eyes. The prince from the United Kingdom was the youngest of three siblings and may never become king. Kai, on the other hand, would be coronated next week. What if she refuses anyone else, said Queen Camilla, lifting an eyebrow that had seen too many youth surgeries over the years. When no one responded to the question, she continued, I don't mean to raise undue alarm, but have you considered that her reason for coming to Earth might be to secure this alliance through force? Perhaps she intends to brainwash the young prince into marrying her. Kai's stomach flipped. He could see his unease mirrored in the faces of the other di diplomats. Could she do that, he asked. When no one was quick to answer, he turned to Torin. It took far, far too long for Torn to shake his head, looking frighteningly uncertain. No, he said. Perhaps in theory, but no. In order to keep up the ruse, she could never leave your side. As soon as you were no longer under her influence, you could prove that the marriage wasn't legitimate. She wouldn't risk that. You mean we hope she wouldn't risk it, said Kai, not feeling very comforted. What about Levana's daughter, Princess Winter, said President Vargas. Has there been any discussion of her? Stepdaughter, said Torin. And what should we discuss in regards to the Lunar Princess? Why can't we form a marriage alliance with her, said Queen Camellia. She can't be any worse than Levana. Torin folded his hands atop the table. Princess Winter was an of another mother, and her father was a mere palace guard. She has no royal blood. But Luna might still honor a marriage alliance through her, said Kai. Wouldn't they? Torin sighed, looking like he wished Kai had kept his mouth shut. Politically, perhaps, but it does not change the fact that Queen Levana is in the difficult position of needing to marry and produce an heir who will continue the bloodline. I do not think she will agree to marry off her stepdaughter, so long as she requires a suitable marriage arrangement. And there is no hope, said the African Prime Minister, that the Lunars will ever accept Princess Winter as a queen. Only if you can convince them to give up their superstitions, said Torin, and we all know how deeply those are ingrained in their culture. Otherwise, we will, they will always insist on an heir of the royal bloodline. And what if Levana never has an heir? What will they do then? Kai slid his gaze to his advisor and raised an eyebrow. I'm not sure, Torin answered. I'm sure the royal family has plenty of distant cousins who would be e eager to stake their claim to the throne. So if Levana must marry, said the South African representatives, and she will only marry a Commonwealth emperor, 
and the Commonwealth Emperor refuses to marry her, what then? We are at a stalemate. Perhaps, said the Governor General Williams, she will make good on her threats. Torin shook his head. If her desire were to start a war, she's had plenty of opportunities. It seems clear, shot back the Governor General, that her desire is to be Empress, but we don't know what she has planned if you won't. Actually, we do have an idea, said President Vargas, his voice heavy. I'm afraid we no longer need to speculate that Levana intends to start a war against Worth. Our sources lead me to believe that war is not only likely, but imminent. An uneasy rustle shifted through the room. If our theories are correct, said President Vargas, Levana is planning to move against Earth within the next six months. Kai leaned forward, fidgeting with the collar of his shirt. What theories? It seems Queen Levana is building an army. Confusion swept through the room. Certainly the moon has had an army for some time, said Prime Minister Bromstad. It is hardly news, nor is it controversial. We cannot request that they forego the keeping of an army entirely, much as we might like to. This is not the moon's normal army, soldiers and thermometers, said President Vargas, nor is it like any army we keep on Earth. Here are some photographs that our orbiting operatives were able to obtain. The president's image faded and was replaced with a fuzzy picture, as if taken from very far away. Satellite photos taken without sa sunlight. Nevertheless, in the grainy picture, Kai could make out rows and rows of men standing. He squinted, and another picture flipped under the screen, closer up, showing the backs of four men from up above. But Kai noticed with a shock, these were not men. Their shoulders were too wide, too hunched, their barely discernible profiles too stretched. Their backs were covered in what appeared to be fur. Another picture came on the screen. It showed a half dozen of the creatures from the front, their faces a cross between man and beast. Their noses and jaws protruded awkwardly from their heads, their lips twisted in perpetual grimaces. White spots erupted from their mouths. Kai could not see them clearly, could not tell for sure, but they gave him the distinct impression of fangs. What are those creatures? asked Queen Camilla. Mutants, answered President Vargas. We believe they are genetically engineered lunars. This is a project we assume has been going on for many decades. We have estimated 600 of them in this holding alone, but we suspect there are more, lightly in the network of lava tubes beneath the moon's surface. There could be thousands, tens of thousands for all we know. And did they possess magic? It was a hesitant question posed by the Canadian rep. The picture disappeared, showing the American president again. We do not know. We have not been able to see them train or do anything other than stand in formation and march in and out of the caverns. They are lunar, said Queen Camilla. If they are not dead, then they possess magic. We have no proof that they kill their ungifted infants, interrupted Torin. And as exciting as it is to look at these pictures and create wild speculations, we must keep in mind that Queen Levana has not yet attacked Earth, and we have no evidence that these creatures in are intended for such an attack. What else could they be intended for, said the Governor General Williams. Manual labor, said Torin, daring anyone to deny the possibility. The Governor General sniffed but said nothing. We should, of course, be prepared should a war come to pass, but in the meantime, our priority needs to be forming an alliance with Luna, not an amp, alienating it with paranoia and distrust. No, said Kai, propping his chin on his fist. I think this is the perfect time for paranoia and distrust. Torrance scowled. Your Highness. It seems you've all missed the very obvious point of these pictures. President Vargas puffed out his chest. What do you mean? You say they've probably been building this army for decades, perfecting whatever science they've used to create these creatures. So it would seem. Then why have we only noticed it now? He waved his hand at the screen where the images had been. Hundreds of them, standing out in the open as if they have nothing better to do, waiting to have their pictures taken. He folded his arms on top of the table, watching as uncertain inspections turned toward him. Queen Levana wanted us to see her spook army. She wanted us to take notice. You think she's trying to threaten us? said Prime Minister Cameron. Kai shut, and shut his eyes, seeing the rows of beasts fresh in his mind. No, I think she's trying to threaten me. Chapter 27 The hover rumbled to a stop outside the quarantine. Cinder flew out the side hatch and immediately reeled back, covering her nose with her elbow. Her gut heaved at the stench, rotting flesh intensified by the steamy afternoon heat. Just outside the warehouse's entrance, a group of medroids were loading dead bodies into a hover to be carted away. Their forms bloated and discolored each with a red slit on their wrist. Cinder looked away, keeping her eyes averted and her breath held as she slid past them to the warehouse. The sunlight turned from blaring to murky, caught by the green sheeting on the windows along the ceiling. The quarantine had been near empty before, 
Now it was overflowing with victims, every age, every gender. Buffeting fans on the ceiling did little to dispel the sweltering heat or the smell of death. The air was heavy with it. Med droids buzzed between the beds, but there were not enough of them to tend to all the sick. Cinder slipped down an eye at Aloe, gasping for shallow breaths against her sleep. She spotted Peony's green brocade blanket and ran to the foot of the bed. Peony! When Peony didn't stir, she reached out and placed a hand on her shoulder. The blanket was soft, warm, but the bulk beneath it didn't move. Shaking, Shinder grasped the edge of the comforter and pulled it back. Peony whimpered, a mild pro protest, which sent relieved chills across Cinder's arms. She slumped down beside the bed. Stars, Peony, I came as soon as I heard. Peony squinted up at her, eyes blurry. Her face was ashen, her lips peeling. The dark splotches on her neck had begun to fade to lavender beneath the surface of her ghostly skin. Eyes on Cinder, she pulled her arm out from beneath the blanket and spread her fingers, displaying their blue-black tips and the yellowish tinge of her nails. I know, but it's going to be all right. Still panting, Cinder unbuckened, unbuttoned the pocket on the side of her cargo pants and pulled out the glove that normally lived on her right hand. The vial was in one of its fingers, protected. I brought something for you. Can you sit up? Peony pulled her hand into a loose fit and tucked it again beneath the blanket. Her eyes were hollow. Cinder didn't think she'd heard her. Peony? A ping echoed in Cinder's head. Her display showed an incoming message from Adri and the familiar surge of anxiety that came with it clear Cinder's throat. She dismissed the message. Peony, listen to me. I need you to sit up. Can you do that? Mom? Peony whispered, spittle collecting at the corner of her lips. She's at home. She doesn't know that you're dying. But of course, Adri did know. The calm would have gone to her too. Pulse racing, Cinder bent over Peony and slid her arm beneath her shoulder. Come on, I'll help you. Peony's expression didn't change. The blank corpse stare. But she, she did let out a pain groan when Cinder lifted her up. I'm sorry, she said, but I need you to drink this. Another ping, another message from Adri. This time, irritation welled up in Cinder, and she shut off her net link, blocking any more incoming messages. It's from the palace. It might help. Do you understand? She kept her voice low, where the other patients might hear, might riot against her. But Peony's gaze, Peony's gaze remained empty. A cure, Peony, she hissed against her ear. An antidote. Peony said nothing had drooped against Cinder's shoulder. Her body had gone limp, but she was light as a wooden doll. Cinder's throat felt coated in sand as she stared into Peony's empty eyes, eyes looking past her, through her. No, Peony, didn't you hear me? Cinder pulled Peony fully against her and uncorked the vial. You have to drink this. She held the vial to Peony's lips, but Peony didn't move, didn't flinch. Peony! Hand trembling, she coaxed, coaxed Peony's head back. Her papery lips fell open. Cinder forced her hand to sit still as she lifted the vial, afraid to spill a single drop. She set the glass against Peony's lips and held her breath, but paused. Her heart was convulsing. Her head felt heavy with tears that wouldn't come. She shook her head harshly. Peony, please! When no sound or air passed through Peony's lips, Cinder lowered the vial. She buried her head into the crook of Peony's neck, gritting her teeth until her jar ached. Each breath stung as it entered her throat, rank with the stench around her but even now she caught whiffs of peony shampoo from so many days past. Clutching the vial in her fist, she gently re released peony, letting her slip back onto the pillow. Her eyes were still open. Cinder slammed her fist onto the mattress. Some of the antidote splashed up over her thumb, squeezing her eyes until stars flashed before her. She slumped over and planted her face into the bank blanket. Damn it. Damn it, peony. Rocking back on her heels, she sucked in a long, uneven breath and gazed at her little sister's heart-shaped and lifeless eyes. I kept my promise. I brought it for you. She barely refrained from shattering the vial in her fist. Plus, I talked to Kai, Peony. Peony, he's going to dance with you. He told me he would. Don't you get it? You can't die. I'm here. I... A splitting headache rocked, against her bed, rocked her against the bed. She gripped the edge of the mattress and lowered her head, letting it hang to her chest. The pain was coming from the top of her spine again but it did not overwhelm her like before, just uncomfortable heat, like a sunburn on the inside. It passed, leaving only a dull throbbing behind, and the thought of Peony's blank stare haunting her. She lifted her head and corked the vial with weak fingers, slipping it back into her pocket. Reaching up, she closed Peony's eyes. Cinder heard the familiar crunch of treads on the dirty concrete, and spotted a medroid coming toward her, no water or damp rags in his prongs. It paused on the other side of Peony's bed, opened its torso, and received a scalpel. 
Cinder reached across the bed and clamped her gloved hand over Peony's wrist. No, she said louder than she intended. Nearby patients lowered their heads toward her. The android sensor rose to her, still dim. Thieves. Convicts. Fugitives. You can't have this one. The android stood with its blank white face, the scalp jutting from its torso. Bits of dried blood clung to the edge. Without speaking, the android reached forward with one of its free arms and latched onto Peony's elbow. I have been programmed. I don't care what you've been programmed to do. You can't have this one. Cinder yanked Peony's arm out of the android's grip. The pincher left deep scratches across her chin. I must remove and preserve her ID chip, the android said, re reaching forward again. Cinder bent over the bed and plastered her hand against the android sensor, holding it at bay. I said you're not getting it. Leave her alone. The android swung the scalpel up, burying the tip into Cinder's glove. It clanged, metal on metal. Cinder reeled back from surprise. The blade clung to the thick fabric of her work gloves. Gritting her teeth, she wrenched the scalpel from the glove and jammed it into the android's center. Glass shattered. The glowing yellow light flashed out. The android wheeled back, metal arms swinging, loud beeps and error messages spilling from its hidden speakers. Cinder barreled over the bed and slammed her fist into the android's head. It crashed to the ground, silenced, arms still twitching. Panter, Cinder looked around. The patients who could were sitting up in bed, blinking glossy eyes. A medroid four aisles away left its patient and rambled toward her. Cinder sucked in her breath. Crouching down, she reached into the android's shattered sensor and grabbed the scalpel. She spun back to Peony, the disheveled blankets, the scratches on her arm, the blue fingertips dangling over the side of the bed. Kneeling beside her, she asked for hurried forgiveness while she grasped her sister's fragile wrist. She spliced the scalpel into the soft tissue. Blood dribbled out of the wound and into her glove, mixing with years of grime. Peony's fingers twitched when Cinder hit a tendon, making her jump. When the cut was wide enough, she peeled it open with her thumb, revealing bright red muscle, blood. Her stomach squirmed, but she dug the tip of the scalpel in as carefully as she could, easing up the square chip. I'm so, so sorry, she whispered, setting the mutilated wrist down on Peony's stomach and standing. The grating of the medroid's treads worked closer. Ashes, ashes. She spun toward the dry sing-song bell, voice, scalpel gripped firmly in one hand, Peony's chip protected in the other. The small boy in the next aisle shrank back as his dilated eyes spotted the weapon. The nursery rhyme faded away. It took Cinder a moment to recognize him. Chang Sumto from the market. Sasha's son. His skin now glossy with sweat, black hair matted to one side of his head from sleeping too much. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Everyone who was strong enough to sit up was staring at her. Stealing a breath, Cinder swept toward Sumto. She fished the vial from her pocket and forced it into his clammy fingers. Drink this. The medroid reached the foot of the bed, and Cinder shoved it aside. It toppled to the ground like a fallen pawn. Sunto's delirious eyes followed her without recognition. Drink it, she ordered, pulling out the stopper and forcing the vial up to his mouth. She waited for his lips to close around it, and then she ran. The sun momentarily blinded her as she bolted into the street. Blocked from her hover by the medroids and two gurneys of dead patients, she spun and ran in the other direction. She turned a corner and had gone four blocks when she heard another hover ahead at the hum of magnets awaking beneath her pounding feet. Lynn Cinder, came a booming voice over the speaker. You are hereby ordered to halt and be taken into peaceful custody. She cursed. Were they arresting her? Planting her feet, she turned to face the white hover, panting. It was a law enforcement vehicle, manned by more androids. How had they gotten to her so quickly? I didn't steal it, she yelled, holding up her fist with Peony's chip and clothes. It belongs to her family, not to you or to anyone else. The hover settled to the ground, its engine still thrumming. An android alighted from the ramp, its yellow light scanning Cinder up and down as it approached her. It held a taser in its frog. She shuffled back, her heels kicking up debris on the deserted street. I haven't done anything wrong, she said, her hands extended toward the android. The medroid was an attacking me. It was self-defense. Lynn Cinder, said the machine's mechanical voice. We have been contacted by your legal guardian in regard to your unauthorized disappearance. You are hereby in violation of the Cyborg Protection Act and have been labeled a runaway cyborg. Our orders are to apprehend you by force if necessary and return you to your legal guardian. If you come peaceably, this infraction will not be recorded on your permanent record. Cinder squinted, confused. A bead of sweat rolled over her eyebrow as she looked from the android who had spoken to a second android just leaving the hover's ramp. Wait, she said, lowering her hands. Adri sent you? And that is the end of chapter 27. Join us tomorrow for chapter 28.